all good morning? Are we awake? Good. I'm awake. <laughs> all right, uh, we picked that song for a reason. Today's sermon is called The Battle, and as I mentioned uh, during oh, a few minutes ago, it is the, the fourth and, and final part of this series on prayer. And I love the imagery from that song, that the battle, I will fight the battle on my knees. I think this is really, really important for Christians to understand. The battle begins on our knees. See, uh, I think the modern Christian, more often than not, uses prayer as a last resort. So if you didn't hear that first part, I think you just perked up just now. <laughs> because we are all guilty of this. This is a... Uh, a corporate thing that we all struggle with, some of us more than others, that uh, it's, it's the last resort. And it's our tendency to finish the battle on our knees rather than start it. Now, just imagine with me for a second a great army that's coming and, and raiding a castle. You know, they start on their horses and they start as they go. They charge, right? Um... It's interesting. That's, that's the human way of doing things. And yeah, and so at the end of that battle, the men and women who are on their knees have lost the battle, right? That's the imagery of a, of a human war, human battle. And I think for us, we really need to readjust our thinking as Christians because that's not how the spiritual battle works. It begins on your knees. And so when big things happen... Instead of going like, well, we need to act. We need to do this. We need to do that. You need to start with prayer. You start by saying, i got to pray about this. Because what, uh, what happens instead is we exhaust all of our human effort and then wonder why it doesn't work. And then we fall exhausted and go like, God, please help at that point. And so what this, is ex- this exposes our doubts about the power of prayer. Maybe even the ability of God to move. Or maybe even that he's listening. It exposes a whole bunch of things. But especially our self-reliance. And so my friends, the picture I want us going to go into this sermon today is we start the battle on our knees. Because the story in scripture is that's where we start. We end on our feet. We have the victory. Jesus has already won the victory. And so it's really important for us to remember this as Christians. Prayer is action. It is not a trying to do all that you can first and then ending. So today, we're talking about the battle, and specifically, we're going to get into prayer and fasting. What, what, uh, you know, what is speci- really specifically fasting, and I, I was going to just say fasting, but prayer and fasting go hand in hand. You can't, you know, as fast, you need to have prayer involved in, in a fast, so I think that's super important. Um, and so that we're going to talk a little bit about both. So first of all, the first question that comes to mind, okay, the battle, well, what battle are we talking about here? And I think most of us have kind of caught the flavor here in our introduction. Which battle? Well, it, uh, here's, uh, Paul outlines it in chapter 6 of Ephesians, and we've, we've talked about this a lot. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, meaning people, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is something we need to be reminded of over and over. This is the war. This is the battle. Our fight is not against people. It's not against the seen. What is seen? What is temporary? It is, it is against what is not seen. It's behind all of the stuff. We prayed about it a few minutes ago when we prayed for Ukraine. Something is behind all of this. It's a great enemy. You see, we, uh, our great enemy, Satan, is the master of misdirections, misdirection. And uh, I, w- I wanted to start this, seri- or this sermon with, a, with an epic story of a surprise attack. And I'd, so I just read and read and read all of these surprise attacks, and they're fascinating. And what I realize is there's, there's no way there's time for this. <laughs> But I can actually say, hey, yeah, there's lots of ones that we're familiar with from Pearl Harbor would be one of more recent one, right? Um, we're, we're ready for the enemy attack. 
I don't want the Christian church to be like that because that's, a, I think, in some ways, that's what we're doing. We are not ready. We don't even know who our enemy really is. And so he's a master of misdirection, and he wants you to fight all the other battles because if he can get you out of this fight, the fight that is a kingdom assignment from God himself for us, well, then he, you, can, you can waste all your energy and all this other stuff in that fight. But there is a battle that is going on, and we need to know which one we're fighting. It's very important. So Christians have traditionally believed that this battle happens on three fronts. There's these three enemies of the soul, and this is for a couple of thousand years since, since it began with Jesus. Uh, we find this in the New Testament, and here are the three enemies of the soul. The world, flesh, and the devil. Now, in my introduction to this sermon, which, by the way, we're still in, <laughs> I want to very quickly flesh this out. What is the world, the flesh, and the devil? So we can get into our topic of the day with uh, prayer and fasting. And so, hold on. We're going to go tight. We're going to go fast. Uh, but I just want to give you an overview uh, we, I don't think we can talk about fasting because fasting, by, by the way, is one of the weapons that we've been given to fight one of these enemies. And so I need to, we need to kind of lay some groundwork to be thinking on. Uh, this, this battle we are fighting is on three fronts. First of all, we have the battle, the ancient, sorry, the ancient enemy of the soul, the world. Now the world is used in three different ways in the New Testament. And so we have to we have to kind of go like, okay, so what do you mean by the world? Because, here we go, it means the planet. It can mean the physical earth, right? Um, that's used in multiple times throughout, in fact, the whole, the whole Bible um, uses the, the term world to talk about the actual physical planet. Secondly, people, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. What it's talking about there is the people, that God's special attention and special love has been directed toward a certain part of his creation called the world or people. And then we have other things like in, you know, 1 John. It talks about uh, not being, <laughs> talks about kind of the opposite. Don't love the world. You're like, what? Didn't Jesus just say that God loves the world? Right? It's using the world in different terms here. So now what 1 John introduces is do not love the world or anything in the world is this is something more specific. It is thinking, patterns of thinking and living that oppose God. So not just secular life, it's patterns of living and thinking that actually oppose, they're anti-God. That's the world. And there's a big draw, there's a big lure from the world, and that's one of the battles that we fight. So it could be ideologies, philosophies and lifestyles that are hostile toward God and run contrary to his ways, right? It could be right-leaning, it could be left-leaning, it could be whatever-leaning. If it's not the way of Jesus and if it's hostile toward God and posing his ways, then it's part of the world. To his, uh, contrary to his ways and his design for life. And that's why you have, you know, like James chapter 4, where he talks about friendship with the world. Don't, you know, you adulterous people, he says. <laughs> Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? This is what he's talking about. It's, it's this opposition to God. It's this way of thinking and living. It's no, he's not talking about people there, right? He's talking this type of world here. He's talking about these ways of thinking and living. And when we embrace those things and try to kind of, oh, let's be Christian and this. And we'll just merge these things and we'll just live this life. Well, that's different. That's not Christian. That's not the way of Jesus. There's only one way. It's the way of Jesus. And so uh, this is what Paul says in Romans. He says, so talking about patterns here, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Okay, now that's what he's, he's referring to this great enemy but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So he wants us to renew our minds, to think differently, and hopefully that can happen here this morning a little bit. Second great enemy, ancient enemy of the soul, is the flesh. Now, the flesh, again, the flesh is actually used in multiple ways, in, especially in the New Testament as well. In fact, there's three different ways that it is used. Mostly it's used in two ways, though, to talk about either people 
which was in our text, flesh and blood, right? The flesh there is people. We wrestle not against people, flesh and blood. Or it's used in this term, that it is one of the, it is to refer to our own sinful and disordered desires or loves, appetites and will, or we often talk about it as the heart. There's disordered desires, appetites, right? These cravings of the flesh, we often call them, that are sinful. And so that's the flesh. So James, for instance, James chapter 1 talks about this because we often think of all of the things that entice us as outside of us. But this is what James says. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. There's, there's the enemy. It's the flesh. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives, brings forth death. So that's the flesh. And we're, gonna, we're actually going to delve into the flesh a little bit more uh, a little bit later. The third, of course, is the devil. This is the one we're most aware of, right? We talk about this. this you know, we talk about this quite a bit. Um, here's the image I want you to have because I don't think we have, often we have the, maybe a more palatable image of Satan. But just think, I want you to think about this, that our enemy, the devil, is more evil than you can possibly imagine. And just look what's going on in our world and the evil that's happening. It's like some of it you can't even look at. It's just like awful. Our enemy is worse than that. He's more evil than you can possibly imagine. And here's the image that we get from Revelation chapter 12. There's a war in heaven. And Satan and, and his uh, minions get thrown down to earth. And, and in Revelation 12, it says there's great rejoicing in heaven. And then it follows up because he's gone, right? The great dragon has been thrown down. And then right following it says, But woe to those who are on earth, for the devil has been thrown down and is uh, with great fury is waging war against the people of God. This character of immense evil that we can't even imagine is warring. He's committed himself to destroying the children of the woman who is in the Revelation 12, representing um, in one of the things that represents is the church, or she represents. And so how does he do that? Through lies, accusations, condemnation. That's what he's, that's his tools, All right? Jesus called him the father of lies, the deception. All right, so that's our great enemy. Now that's a very like, light overview. You could do a series on each one of these like easily. Uh, but that's just, this is just a reminder of the fight that we're in. This is the battle. All right, so let's get into it. Four purposes. So what is fasting? Why should you fast? Like what's so great about it? So here's, here's how I want to do this, because I had lists. <laughs> I had pages of like fasting does this, fasting does this, fa- like just, just reading and, and researching and just going like all of these things and then just thinking, okay, so how is, how is this, you know, for my own, in my own life, like how has this worked? And so I uh, came up with pages and pages and narrowed it down to four. So this is an overview again of fasting. First of all, fasting is meant to prepare us for battle. Specifically, the battle against the flesh. And God has given us this tool to help us. It's a weapon. So what is it meant to do? Why is it preparing us for battle? Well, here's three things that it does for us to prepare us for battle. It realigns ourselves with God, his will, and his purposes. Definitely one of the things a fast is meant to do. Now, when we're talking a fast, we're talking a biblical fast. So in a biblical fast, it's always food. You can, you can fast from other, thing, other things. We call that a fast, but it's not a biblical fast. That would be more like abstaining from stuff. A biblical fast is food. It's, a very, it's your most basic need. And we'll get into why that is in, in a moment here. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um. So it's meant to realign ourselves with God. And so as Bob preached last week, and we're going we're gonna to hit a, a story for the second time uh, from last week with, with David. David was realigning his, his, uh, his, his will with God's will 
uh, as he prayed and um, fasted for his, for his son. Secondly, it's to reorder our disordered desires and loves. And we're going we're gonna to flesh that out in a, in, a, in a minute here. And thirdly, it's to renew our affection, trust, and commitment to God. Specifically, to stir our affections for Jesus. So this is prayer and fasting. These, all of the spiritual disciplines are meant to prepare us, whether it's reading the Bible, prayer, fasting, whatever, solitude. They are part of their purpose, all of those things is to prepare us for the war and to make sure we're fighting the right war, that we're in the right battle. All right, uh, secondly, purposes for fasting. Oh, sorry, before we get into that, I'm going to introduce this. So this is all what, this is what happens. Uh, We have this beautiful example in Matthew chapter 4 of Jesus praying and fasting. So Jesus gets baptized uh, by, by John the Baptist, Baptist in, the, in the river, Jordan. Out he comes, and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, it says. He's filled with the Spirit. He's, he's, God is preparing him for his mission, for his battle, and then sends him out to the desert for 40 days. Right? There's so much symbolism here that I don't have time to get into all of it, um, but we can't miss it, that this is preparation preparation period. Israel was 40 years in the desert before entering the, the promised land. Um, you know, Noah's Ark. For, there's, there's something really specific about 40 days. So let's get into the story. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Yeah, for sure, right? <laughs> And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Right? Easy for Jesus. What does Jesus do? He answers, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot on a stone. Using scripture, right? Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. I wonder what that looked like. Isn't that a cool ending? It's like, what? <laughs> wow, that sounds awesome. So let's, let's look into this. So obviously he was being prepared for this temptation, but also for his ministry. He was entering the fray. He was becoming a target now. He he was now preparing for this three years of ministry and mission that he would be on. And God has, he's been baptized, he's been filled with the Spirit, and now he has gone through 40 days in fasting. So he is at his spiritual height of power after this fasting. Now, I often have thought about the enemy coming in here and going like, getting him at his weak point. Because that, you know, the enemy's, he fights dirty, right? He doesn't come with a big army and try to sweep us. He fights from the shadows. He does horrible things. It's guerrilla warfare. That's spiritual warfare. It's like guerrilla warfare. He comes from the shadows and does all these things. It's terrible. (laughs) I hate it. But this 40 days has prepared Jesus, so he is at his greatest strength at this point. And so you guys say, well, how is that? Because remember, we introduced this idea. Fasting specifically is a weapon that God has given us to fight the flesh. And so how does that work? Well, resisting the flesh is our second purpose. 
And so we have two weapons that God has given us. Confession, meaning confess your sins to one another, right? One of the big pushes of the New Testament. Don't, don't live in the dark, live in the light. That doesn't mean you should come up here in front of a big crowd and just go like, you know, we'll just tell, take turns and tell everyone our sins. It actually is talking about living closely with other believers, finding those one, two, three other people uh, that you can walk closely and deeply with and that they know all the secrets that you are known by these, this men, these men or these women. That's what it's talking about there. That's the people that confess because those are the people that hold you accountable, right? That's where that comes. But that's a whole sermon in itself. We're doing the second one, fasting. There are weapons to fight against the flesh. So how does this work? First of all, the, the, the actual physical, um, <laughs> I'm missing a word, the physical action of fasting is meant to replace that basic need of food. We introduced this idea a few minutes ago, this basic need of food with God himself. I want God to be my sustenance. What does Jesus say? First temptation, man shall not live by bread alone. He has replaced any kind of desire for, for, for sustenance as food as his first order. He's knocked it down a notch. God is my sustenance. He's my life, the Father. And so that's what fasting does. It helps us to replace that basic need of food with Jesus himself. He is our sustenance. He's the bread of life. Remember he said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread. Secondly, self-control over appetites and temptation. It's a training ground. We talked about preparing. Right? First one's preparing. It's a training ground for self-control and our appetites. It's training our appetites to be subject to us, to our will. And temptation, right? What did Jesus, what did it, God took him into the desert because for temptation. <laughs> this is where it was going to happen. But he needed to go through that preparation first, right? So that we can resist temptation. Thirdly, it takes the focus off what we don't have and places it on what we do have. It teaches us that it's okay to not get what you want. This basic need, your body wants food and you're teaching your body to not get what it wants. Disordered desires and loves. You want to reorder those things because they're off constantly. And so this is, this is how it works. Here's, um, here's a quote from John Mark Comer in his book, uh, Live No Lies. Fasting trains our bodies to get what they want, or sorry, to not get what they want, the opposite. At least, not all the time. This is yet another reason why in a culture run by feelings and desire, fasting is a bizarre idea even to Christians. We assume that we must get what we want to be happy. This is the assumption that our culture lives under that we are subject to as well. And by want, we often mean what our flesh wants. This simply isn't true. With fasting, we decide of our own accord to not give our bodies what they want, food. As a result, when somebody else decides not to give us what we want, or life circumstances, or even God, we don't freak out, rage, or go ballistic on Twitter. We've trained our souls to be happy and at peace, even when we don't get what we want. This is a big deal, you guys. We all are in this boat. We all need to be trained, need training in this. Because isn't that the, the, the flesh in a nutshell, this war that we're fighting? We want to get what we want. And we, if we don't get what we want, how could we possibly be happy? And so, God has given us fasting to help teach us that. Not getting what you want is okay. We don't have to throw a tantrum. Thirdly, purpose of, of prayer and fasting is to humble ourselves. So we have story after story throughout the Bible of men and women humbling themselves before God and using fasting to do that. So in Jonah, just a few weeks ago, 
we finished a series on Jonah. This is fabulous, by the way. If you haven't seen that, you, you can go onto our YouTube channel and watch the sermons. They're awesome. What a great story. It's not just a children's story. <laughs> There's some amazing stuff in there. But the people of Nineveh, what do they do? When they hear Jonah's terrible message, <laughs> what five words in Hebrew it is, right? <laughs> God's, and he doesn't even tell them to repent. He says, God's going to destroy you. <laughs> and so what do they do? In fact, I think it's in 40 days, is it not? What do they do? To repent and to show. One of the things they do is fast. In fact, it's an order from the king of Assyria, this terrible, evil guy. Orders a fast. We need to humble ourselves before this God. We need to repent. Right? So in order to repent, you have to humble. There's no way to, to, to repent from your sins without humbling yourself. It's impossible. Because if you don't, you're just sinning with pride. <laughs> and then in 1 Samuel, so the story goes, we have the Philistines who are the enemy of Israel and they, they're fighting and, and they've captured the ark and they keep beating up Israel. <laughs> and so finally, the prophet Samuel draw, brings Israel together and they pray and fast. And what happens? Well, the nation repents. They humble themselves before God, fasting and prayer. And the result is a victory over their enemy, the Philistines. One of the most fascinating, King Ahab, in 1 Kings chapter 21. This one blows me away because this is one evil guy. In fact, in this chapter, he 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 is just so jealous that this guy named Naboth has his garden that he likes. He decides he's going to kill him because Naboth won't sell it to him. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> That'll teach him, right? That'll learn him. And he goes and he kills Naboth. <laughs> and then the prophet Elijah comes and goes like, hmm, you know, God sees all this stuff, by the way. And pronounces judgment on Ahab. Well, what does Ahab do? He repents. Tears his clothes, puts on sackcloth, and, or lays in sackcloth and ashes, it says, which is horrible on your skin, right? <laughs> and fasts. Humbles himself before God, and this just blows me away. God relents. He doesn't bring what he said he was going to bring on Ahab, which is amazing because this king was terribly evil. In fact, Ahab and Jezebel are often... You know, the pinnacle we talk about, the, you know, evil. <laughs> you call Ahab and Jezebel, there you go. And God relented. It's amazing. So a fast is used to humble ourselves before God. Fourthly and last, finally, we, f- we can fast in order to move the hand of God to intercede, to work on our behalf. We can use a fast for that. And there's multiple um, places through scripture where people fast and pray so that God moves, so that God moves in their behalf, that he intercedes, that he protects. And so this is uh, the story that Bob talked about, and I'm going to finish the story. He talked about the start, I'm going to finish about the end. And so David and Bathsheba have great sin. Uh, it's really, it's on David, right? He's the king. And uh, a child is conceived out of this um, sinful relationship. And uh, David's kind of thought he's covered it all up, and of course he gets exposed by it, and um, David repents. But one of the judgments that God says is that the son that David and Bathsheba conceived will die. So what does David do? Goes, shuts all the doors, goes up to an upper room, on his knees, fasts and prays and weeps for seven days. At the end of the seven days, the news comes. Your majesty. Can you imagine being the guy bringing this news? Your son. Your son is dead. That hits me hard. Like, wow. Seriously? He's fasted and prayed. King Ahab. Look, King Ahab. Look what he did. Fasted and prayed for a few days. God forgave him. And then relented on his judgment. Now, did God forgive David? Yes. But this is why realignment is so important. 
A fast isn't just, you can't manipulate God with a fast. God doesn't owe you anything because you fasted. And this is such an incredible story of that. David, here's the news. He washes his face, cleans up, breaks his fast, and goes and eats. It's really significant. The imagery in this story is that David has aligned his will with God's will and his purposes and has accepted what God is about to do. That was the result of the fast. That's what happened to Jesus too, right? That's the result of the fast, that realignment. And so for David, because I don't think Jesus had any desires out of order, um, but David, of course, did. And so I think those things, all that happened, reordered, loves, reordering of desires and a realignment with God. I'm like, okay, God. And so that's what uh, the spiritual disciplines are meant to do. And that is, for me, like an incredible story. We just can't manipulate God through fasting, you guys. It's not a, it's not a means for you to, yeah, I did this. And so if, you, if <laughs> the best example is Isaiah 58. Read that. And God's like, you call that a fast? Wait, you think I owe you something? Because you fasted from food for a little bit? Well, look how you're living your life. Right? So that's Isaiah 58. You can read it if you want. It's pretty, pretty awesome, especially the, the blessing that comes after. So that's our, our four purposes of fasting. So um, here's, we got to ask the question. I, thought, I didn't know Bob was for sure. Sorry, <laughs> I just cut everybody off. They're like, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, ask the question. I didn't know Bob was going to be here. He's on holidays, but he's here. So <laughs> I was just doing it in his honor now. It's like, ah, oh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so what? Okay, awesome. That's, that sounds good. I'd like to do this, but how do we get this done? How does this happen? What are we supposed to do? All right, two things. Number one, you're in a battle. Don't start a fast until you're in the proper battle. Get that realigned. Pray. Talk to God. Where are we going here? What's in my heart? Psalm 139 has a, a beautiful ending where it talks about search me and know me. In fact, it starts like that too and ends in the same way. Search me and know me. Find out what's in my heart. If there's any wickedness, bring it out. Wonderful prayer. Scary, but awesome. So you need to be aware that there's a battle. That's First of all, don't deny that this battle is happening. Don't, you know, we're not, the two ditches are, there's kind of a, a demon behind every bush and minimizing that you're actually at war in the spiritual realm, that we're part of this, right? So those are the two ditches. We need to be in here. We need to be aware. Secondly, we need to be prepared, right? Got to be in the right battle, aware of it. We need to be prepared. And whatever that takes, let's get prepared for this battle. This is why we're here, you guys. You might think you're here for whatever job title you have or whatever. <laughs> or whatever. That's not why you're here. You have a kingdom assignment. You need to be connected to God, his will, and his purposes. What good is a fast, right? Isaiah 58. What good is a fast if you're off over here? God's purposes are over here. And you need to join the battle because ba- you're in the battle, whether you know it or not whether the master of misdirection has you running off fighting another battle. You're still in this one. We just don't want you to be a casualty of that one, of this battle, because this is the battle, not the other ones. Okay, so you're in a battle. So what? We need to understand this. We need to know this. We need to not forget this. We start this battle on our knees. We're not going to end it that way. Secondly, prayer and fasting. So what? A couple things. Reject, go big or go home mentality. <laughs> that is not going to help you. Yeah, some of us are just like gung-ho for stuff, right? Yeah, you get inspired and you're like, yes, I'm going in. <laughs> I'm going to fast for 40 days just like Jesus, right? Don't, please don't start with a 40-day fast. <laughs> you need to go to your doctor first and kind of figure things out, right? That can be quite devastating. You, In fact, it can kill you. All right, let's start small. Start with a meal once a week or a day, whatever you want. Start small. We don't, you don't need to go the, the, to the power, to power level, right? That, that's, uh, get rid of that mentality. That just makes it overwhelming. 
You go like, and then you start, and then you just fizzle out. There's no way you can keep that up. Start small. Let it grow and build. That's how God works. That's how sanctification works. It's just this slow build throughout your life. God has chosen that. Do that for this too. Start small. Same with prayer. Don't start like, I'm going to knock off two hours a day. I watch, uh, I watch two hours of Netflix, so I'm going to two hours of prayer. Let's not get rid of that mentality. Let's just start small. And you might want to limit your Netflix a little bit. <laughs> or whatever. Let's just, or, or social media or whatever. Let's start small. Let's just start with that connection with Jesus. Let's just be with Jesus. Because that's ultimately that what we're doing with this Closer uh, series. You know, prayer and journal. Let's just be with Jesus. Let's just be with him. He says he's with us. So let's be with him. Practicing the presence of of Jesus. So get rid of that big or go home, <laughs> go big or go home mentality. It doesn't work. Uh, secondly, reject the excuses. Most of them behind them, it's trickery, right? By the deceiver. Things like, uh, I don't know how to pray. Well, tell God that because that's a prayer. And if you know how to speak to people, we speak to God. That's all prayer is just conversation with God, is speaking, it's talking to Him. Right now, I know that's hard, but there's, the reason it's difficult is because there's spiritual opposition here. We're in a battle. Prayer is difficult because it's one of the main weapons that God has given us. And so Satan wants us to doubt the power of prayer. He wants us to go, ah, get off your knees. It's not going to do any good. Do something about it. People on their knees, they've lost the battle. Don't go for those lies. It's trickery. Reject the excuses that you don't know how or it's too big. Start small. It's okay. You know, don't succumb to the guilt and shame of trying, oh, it's not enough. I got to do more. Start small and build up. You got your whole life ahead of you to, to do this. Start small. Don't fall for those excuses. You know how to pray. And if you want to know how to pray better, we have entire books in the Bible here. Like half of the Psalms are these prayers by psalmists and they're called actually, psalm, there's a whole whack of Psalms that fit in the category of Psalms of disorientation. <laughs> ah, I'm disoriented. Yeah, no doubt. You live in the world, right? And so they pour out their heart and there's some weird stuff in there. And it's like, it's because they're pouring out what's in their heart. And then there's this realignment at most Psalms where it realigns back and reorients them. Oh, yeah, but God. Oh, yeah, but God is this. Oh, yeah. So if you want to learn how to pray like that, pr read the Psalms. Paul has tons of prayers in his letters. Get in the Word. So much prayer in here. You can pray Scripture. Pray it for yourself. Pray for your kids. Pray for our, our church. Pray, pray for our community. Pray for our country. You can just pray the prayers that are in there. It's just talking to God. So don't fall for the trickery. And um, the one thing I don't have on here is do it with somebody else, especially to start with. I mean, you can fast on your own or whatever. That's great. But to practice that in community is really awesome. And so just find another person goes like, yeah, I want to do that too. Let's, let's do a lunch. And so when the time we're supposed to be eating our sandwich, you know, five minutes, maybe 10 if you want to go harder. <laughs> Pray for five minutes that God would, and specifically, replace my basic need for this food with you. I want you to be my food. You can do that like on a Friday. We'll just do Friday lunch. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to pray while we're supposed to be eating our sandwich. Don't fall for the, it's too overwhelming, it's too big. You can do this. It's part of the tools that God's given us. That's why we know we can do it. So I hope you've been encouraged. I hope, um, like, there's so much more in fasting that we can talk about, and we've definitely spent our time. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, there's tons. There's so much, so many good books. There's tons of stuff. Um, but don't get in the, you know, the trap of just reading and getting, gaining all this knowledge and then not doing it, right? That's, we're experts at that. Gaining the knowledge and then not doing it. That's what James talks about in James chapter 1, right? Don't deceive yourselves. <laughs> Let's just do it. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much that you haven't left us helpless. First of all, you have promised to always be with us. But this battle isn't just fought on our own. 
that you're with us the whole time. You never leave us or forsake us. So Lord, I just, I just would encourage each person here, Father, uh, do something in their hearts. Give them a vision, this, even something really small, this vision of how it would stir their affections for you right now. Something, something that would just, a little bit, just, I want to think about Jesus a little bit more in my life. Lord, help us get rid of the lies and the trickery that the enemy's placed in, in, in our hearts and in our minds. We don't want to believe that stuff. We want to live for you. We want to be fighting the, the real battles that you have assigned us to as your servants, your, a part of your kingdom. We want that, not the other stuff. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.